without delay, I'm going to announce our very own Margaret Wilcox, the original Tinkerbell. Let me tell you, she is such a delight to talk with. Here you go, Margaret. It's a dangerous thing to hand me a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to you today. I'm excited about it. I get excited about most anything that I can do around the church because it's a brand new church to me and I, I'm, I'm thrilled. And I want to give you a little background about me because if you remember, my title is Looking for Boys and Finding Jesus, right? So I give you a little background so that that's what happened, what actually happened. I was born in 1929. I caused the depression. <laughs> you laugh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I was growing up with my family. I was about three and a half, and suddenly my mother died in childbirth, and my dad was left with uh, uh, four boys and a girl, and what you did back then was you searched for someone to adopt your child. Everybody was adopted every place. So they found some people for me, and believe it or not, these people were born, each one of them was born in 1883. They were old enough to be my grandparents. And they were dears sometimes, they were terror other times, but they decided since it was the depression and I was as cute as a bug that I should go to work. I mean, does that make sense? That's what everybody was doing. So they uh, fixed my hair and through a pull got me into central casting and suddenly in my book, those pictures. So uh, I'm, I'm working away, and I went, the first movie that I ever did, and maybe you've seen it, it is A Midsummer Night's Dream with Olivia de Havilland and um, the other fellow. Anyway, uh, I played, are you ready? I played a fairy. <laughs> yes, I did. Well, I will tell you quickly, as a little child of four years of age, I go to this big studio called Warner Brothers. I did not know what a studio was. I had no idea what a call was, but there I was with my mother. <clears throat> and somebody had just changed my name from um, my original name, which no one would tell me. Excuse me. <clears throat> no one told anybody when you were adopted anything about your adoption. Yeah, so I was suddenly, my last name was Lynch. Okay, Peggy Lynch, all right. Uh, and we go up and we go to this huge building and lots of kids with me. And the man stands there and says, I, I'm not joking, he stands there and says, now we all must be quiet when we go into here, into the uh, s s sound stage, because they may be shooting. <laughs> So we all went in with my mother following me and pushing me ahead. She was the most adorable, aggravating little mother that you could ever be in your entire life. But it was in, you know, smile, Peggy, smile. So I go in, like the rest of the kids, and we look at all the dark corners for the monsters that they must be shooting. <laughs> but they put us right to work, and they chose me as one of the, uh, the, the little uh, fairies and I got my own costume. Then it got exciting. So I did, that was the first time that I met Mickey Rooney. He played Puck on that movie. And uh, it, was, it was great fun, but it was also very isolated. You didn't get to talk much to anybody, and you didn't talk to the other kids. That didn't happen. And the parents, the ladies, didn't, didn't talk to each other. It was really interesting. And then, so they said, well, she did such a good job on that. We'll put her up for another role. And... In half a mile, turn left on the 
Any of you seen the little rascals? Well, that's me up there at the little rascals. And I did about six of those. <clears throat> and I did two more for MGM. And so uh, I, my career was going. Now, why did it excite me? Because my dad, the man, Fred Robb, who adopted me, was so neat. He was such a great guy. And it was how you handled money. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's a little bottle water, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so, so anyway, I could make, are you ready? Hold on. I could make $6 a day working in the movies. And I got a 50 cent piece that they would put in my hand and my mom and dad would let me hold it all the way home for transportation. I tell you, I have never forgotten it. I still have it to this day, that that's why you go out and you do these things and you get the money and you make people happy and they're happy with your work. So I went on with um, my career and I started to learn how to dance, to tap dance. And I tap danced in The Little Rascals. And I gotta see what's coming next. <clears throat> So I worked in, oh, with Elizabeth Taylor, with uh, Greer Garson, with Bing Crosby, with you, you, you name it, I was there. I would sit on people's laps, I would be told how cute I was. I would be told, run over there and smile, run over there and sit down. And it was all in a vacuum. Uh, I, I don't know whether you know it, but the, if you had a child star in a movie, that child star was not to talk or play with any of the children that might be working on the movie. Now that sounds rough, but no. What would happen if the child star caught a cold? It would stop production. So the, uh, Shirley Temple could always play with her, her stand-in. And uh, I never worked with Shirley because I was shorter than she was. And they didn't want anyone smaller than she was, which was right, once again, when you look back on it. So all of that was going on in my life, and those stories are in my book, and one of them is one page long, great fun. I met Mickey Rooney again on another uh, National Velvet, working with Elizabeth Taylor. I doubled her in that movie. But there was something happening that was so exciting to me, and it was called TV. I did, never, I did not like making movies. It is so slow. It is so dark, it is so long, and then you have to do it all over again because they didn't like what happened. And then they would argue about, no, on television, you went in and you did it. And I got my own show. I was a host of Teleteen Reporter on Channel 13 in Los Angeles. And that meant we, went, we found talented uh, children in high school or junior high who would come on the show and show their talent. Does that sound like a show that they're doing right now? <laughs> you know, America's Got Talent. Well, I had a lovely time and met so many people. And, but I still, I still didn't know any boys because, and this was God's will, it really was. My mother uh, kept me uh, away from anything that was happening in the movies and I have to tell you, the things that were happening in the movies were not nice, were not good. The people there were, could degrade you in a moment. And so she was there, and that was it. And so I, I'm working along, and, and I'm fine, and I get a, 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 but my last movie that I did, I get to work with Eddie Cantor. Now, none of you remember Eddie Cantor. But he was the great pavilion. He had the number one TV show, the number one radio show. A very, very funny man who learned to roll his eyes. Can you do that? <laughs> he taught me how. <laughs> and it was on that show that uh, he said, Peggy, because I was Peggy Lynch up until then, 
you don't want to be called Peggy anymore. This is how it actually happened. You don't want to be called Peggy, no Mr. Counter. And he said, uh, we have to find another name for him. Yes, Mr. Counter. <laughs> he said, do you like your first name? I said, Margaret. He said, yes. I said, yes, Mr. Counter. I, I didn't know. <laughs> and so he said, well, we have to get you a last name. <clears throat> we will get you, Norman Carey is my favorite actor. Do you like him? Yes, Mr. Catter. Well, who was Norman Carey? I had no idea in the whole wide world. And, and he said, uh, uh, we're going to call you Margaret Carey from now on, K-E-R-R-Y. And that was all right with me because it sounded Irish. And I always had a hunch that my real family, they were Irish. I just always had that hunch. So from that on, then on, I was Margaret Carey. Who knew this is the craziest business that you could ever be in? Let's see if I have these done correctly. No, I don't. Story of my life. <laughs> Hold on. Ah, so in that movie, uh, it's called If You Knew Susie. It wasn't a great movie. It wasn't a bad movie. It was a movie. <laughs> but I got to show off. <laughs> That's me dancing on a tabletop, doing a really, really, really neat, neat tap nut. It's still on YouTube, I understand. Uh, so from there, I started to really move into television. And as I say, uh, I still didn't know anybody. When you're on the set, uh, you don't really meet anybody, particularly if you're a kid. What you're doing is you're sitting there with your teacher, uh, in a little room with one light over your head, trying to make sense of what schoolwork you, that you are doing. Um, oh, before I do that, to make you really, I, I don't want to make you unhappy because it turned out to be just right. God knew what he was doing. Uh, to put me in school was a problem because you could not get a permit to go out and work in the film industry or any other industry for that matter if you were in public school, it would really take something really big. So I was put in Monticello School for Girls, which was a boarding school for half of the, the students. There weren't many students, but here I was in Monticello School for Girls. And we had about 12 girls in each classroom, in a class that I was in. And I never saw them once I left school. I never saw them outside. I never met them again. I don't know where they are to this day. And that was the kind of school that it was. We were, we were again, isolated. So, uh, but I must tell you, the oldest daughter, uh, Sharon Disney, was in the upper class, and Diane Disney was in the next class, and I had made friends with both, uh, with Diane uh, later on. So here I am, I, I, I don't know really anybody, and my mother, my dear little mother walks into my bedroom, stands holding the door open and said, you are 18, you may now date. <laughs> and she turns around and said, but, 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 I don't know any boys. <laughs> and she said, oh, you'll find them. And won't stop. <laughs> and there I was. I mean, what, what, what do you do now? Well, I was working on the Eddie Cantor movie and I looked around for somebody, and a lady named June Wilson was a dancian for, who's my mother's name? Joan Davis, you know the comedian. And she was doing dance steps for Joan Davis when they were lighting and so on. I told her, I told her my problem. And June said, June said, look, you get yourself all duded up, as we say back on the West Coast, and you get yourself all duded up and you come, Oh well, thank heavens it's water. <laughs> okay. We're all right. Yeah, you're okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, whoever brought those. <laughs> Raise your hand. I think it's fine. Yeah, so you give her a regular chair. Thank you. Would you like a regular chair? I don't know. Thank you. So anyway, she said, you get yourself all duded up. 
and come over on Wednesday night to my house. You've all seen the picture of a Hollywood sign? Yeah. Well, her house was just below that. So I drove up to it. Oh, I look like something, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and I got in the car and followed her about six blocks away to a place called Hollywood First Presbyterian Church. And she said, you'll find the boys here. And I went, really? At a church? We had never gone to church in my family. My mother and father were Masons, and that was an Eastern star. So we never got to church. So I'm, I'm thinking, oh, well, if June says so, okay, June, June knows people. I don't know people. I will follow June. So I go downstairs at the big auditorium downstairs, and sure enough, it was Wednesday night, and there must have been 150 young people there for Christian Endeavor. That's what it was. And there were boys there. I didn't know what I would do with them, but I found them. <laughs> and so I'm sitting back, and I'm thinking, what is going on? This is exciting. This is exciting. And this little lady walks out on the riser in front of us, and she had a, a hat on that seemed to have vegetables growing down, hanging down from her, and she had thick glasses, and she turned around and she said to a couple up there, stop that smooching up there. That's the first time I remember her saying anything. And then she said, I want to tell you what happened today. She said, I was with my daughter Margaret, my sister Margaret, and we were getting ready to do whatever it was, and my car wouldn't start. And Margaret called the mechanic. And as I'm upstairs getting dressed, I looked out the window. And God said to me, Henrietta, you talk to that man about me. And I said, God, I just don't have time. I, you know, we'll have to do it. Henrietta, you talk to that man about me. And I finished my dressing. And he said, Henrietta, you talk to that man about me. And I argue, and finally I said, oh, all right, all right, all right. And she said, she said, here's the short of the story. Young man, stand up. And he was there. Mm -hmm. He became one of Henrietta Mears' boys. They started Campus Crusade for Christ. Mm -hmm. They worked with Billy Graham to get his campaigns on the road, starting particularly in Hollywood. She was known, she started Gospel Light Press. She changed the whole direction of Sunday schools. They still follow Henrietta Mears. Well, I will tell you, I sat there with my jaw hanging open. I had never heard of anybody who could argue with God. <laughs> that just never entered my mind. I had never heard about Jonah. I love him now. I really appreciate him. But I never heard of the book of this or that or the other. I said, I've got to know. I've got to know. And so in a way, I discipled under Henrietta Mears. And a year later, in 1949, uh, God put up with me since 1949 when I accepted Jesus Christ. So searching for boys, you see, brought me to Christ. I wasn't kidding. God does these things. It's really weird if you look back at the odd things that happen. And that's how I got to that church. I never would have gotten to that church otherwise. It, it, it's, well, anyway. So I started to date, not many, just a couple here and there. And a very nice young man named Robert Boke, he was, uh, he was just finishing USC and he was so nice. And we had about 15 dates and off he went. And then I dated uh, the man who was the uh, associate director on, brings us to the next one, I'm working at ABC. I got the job as the daughter of, um, of uh, Charlie Ruggles on the Charlie Ruggles family show of ABC. ABC was the new network. Uh, there was NBC, CBS, and ABC, and we called it the Almost Broadcasting Company <laughs> because it was really having a tough time. But anyway, um, I will show you a picture in just a minute. Uh, and I married, I married the, the associate director uh, on it, and we did. This was amazing to me, and I loved it. 
we did 172 episodes back to back. We did not stop for the summertime. They were back to back. We did the first one in the late afternoon for the East Coast, and then that we had dinner and came back and did the second time for the West Coast. There was no such thing as being able to record it on tape or anything like that. They had to uh, put a camera on the, uh, the TV set and film it that way to get some kind of an episode. Unfortunately, there was a fire at UCLA and uh, most, of, most of the episodes burned up. But I got Well, so far, whoops, wrong one. Aha, here I am with Charlie Ruggles, and you would know him immediately. You watch the old movies, and he was just a dear, dear man. And at the same time, um, we only worked two days to do this, so I got to do my own television show at the same time, and then I was doing voiceovers. Well. Have you kept up with me? <laughs> okay, okay. All right, let's see what I'm going to talk about next. How are we doing on time? You're at 21 minutes. Sorry? 21 minutes. 21 minutes. 21 minutes, okay. Because being 95, almost 94, I can talk to you into the night. You don't have to. Okay. So I, uh, out of ABC, I did a big dance show that they had for uh, two seasons, and the dance director asked me to go over to a box uh, out in the valley, uh, way, way out in Homey Hills, and would I be an assistant dance director at 20th Century Fox on a movie called I'll Get By? And uh, it was, you know, the big musical kind of thing. Again, I said I'd be delighted. So I'm out there working on this thing, and Gloria the Haven doesn't know how to dance, but she can sing, and the other one can sing, but she doesn't know how to dance. It was great fun, and, and I get a call. <coughs> I get a call from my agent. Now listen to this. <clears throat> can you get off tomorrow because they are interviewing for a part of a uh, three and a half inch Sprite? who doesn't talk, and I know that you do pantomime. And I said, well, you know, yeah, duh. Well, we've got the big dance number coming up, and maybe, I, I suppose I could. She said, it's a Disney. I said, at Disney, I'll be there at 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I can't tell you how exciting it was to drive into the gates of Disney, and the man who stood there with the clipboard actually found my name. I, I get really excited at all the little things that other people go on oh, on. No. That's what life is to me. This is exciting to me to be here today to talk to you. It, it's nothing is on. Everything. And so anyway, I, my whole life is about to change, but I had no idea. Uh, so I drive in and I park where I'm supposed to be parking. And uh, he tells me where I should go on the, on the lot. It's a very tiny lot. It's the smallest production lot of any of the movie studios. As a matter of fact, it only had one sound stage at that point. It now has about eight that they got in there. But it, it's very tiny. You can walk it in a half an hour. It, it, you're done. So anyway, I get out and I get lost. Now, I'm used to working at, at, at places like Fox, which is very cold. Warner Brothers is even colder. Warner Brothers says to you, yes, you could come in if you behave yourself, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on you. I mean, it, it really is that. RKO was better. Paramount was a little better. Columbia was chaos. So anyway, I go walk in, and I realize I'm lost. Uh, I've digressed for just a moment. I have a thing called face blindness, and I can't recognize people very well. Sometimes I don't recognize my husband, or I didn't. 
at one time, uh, very embarrassing. But anyway, I didn't know what it was, but it also has a pro problem, gives you a problem with directions. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for a, a workout room. You know, I'm a dancer. That's what, no, along come this tall, lanky guy who turns out to be later on, I meet him again. He is the top animator of the nine old men of Disney. And he says, you look lost. Well, I was stunned because nobody ever asked that if you're on the other lots. They just did, you were just that. And I said, yes, I'm going to see Mark Davis. Remember that name. I'm going to see him. Oh, oh he says he's in that building there. I said, that looks like an office building. I'll take you, he said. And she stopped what he was doing and took me into the, we went up on the third floor and he said, that's his open office door right there. And I thanked him. I, and I was nonplussed that somebody would do that for me. So uh, anyway, I walk in and I meet the man. Now, why I say that this changed my life is because I have never had to go around and say, look how great I am. If you're an actress and you do a part here and a part there and so on, it's look how good I am. All I can say is look how wonderful Tinkerbell is and I'm following along. It's true. It really, and God knew that I couldn't have done that. I could not, I would have been a oh, terrible person. I'm sure I would have. <laughs> I got it made. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I walk in to see Mark Davis, and I know this is small, but it's the one that I have. Up on his wall was this sketch. And that is the first time that I ever saw Tinkerbell. Isn't she something? She's adorable. Well, that was Mark's ability to take nothing and make it into something. So he said, he, he listened to all the things that I had done, and he said, well, let's see what you could do. And I'm going to do two pieces for you right now. One of them is, if you remember, that she uh, lands on a mirror in the nursery. Do you remember that one? And she looks at herself, and then she finds out that her hips are too large for her, as far as she's concerned. I played Tinkerbell as if she were nine years old. And I played her as if she had never seen a mirror before. Because why would a mirror be in Neverland? So it went something like this. had ever asked me in my life before if it would be convenient to come to work. <laughs> and so I said, I'll try. I'll, I'll call over and find out if I could get the day off because it was just going to be for one day. Mark Davis would design what they wanted Tinkerbell to do. And then I would come. And that was my costume, my own bathing suit. I won peace, and I hastened to add with a cover-up, and I was not in front of the camera, and he would tell me what they wanted her to do. Here she's supposed to be jumping off of something, I don't remember. And uh, so I go over to soundstage one the first time, and there's the big camera with the cameraman sitting on it. There's 12 crew with lights and everything, and there's Mark Davis. 
And I walked up to him and I said, Mr. Davis, that's how long ago it was, 72 years ago. And I said, Mr. Davis, we called him Mr. and Mrs. then, you know, remember? No, probably not. <laughs> anyway, what do you want her to be? Do you want her to be ditzy like Betty Boop? Do you want her to be above it all like Queen of the Fairies? And he looked at me and he said, Margaret, we want her to be you. And I said, gosh golly, I think I can do that. <laughs> so he never ever stopped me from anything that I did for her or with her. He just wanted to make sure that I hit my marks and they would bring props. As you can see, there she is looking through the keyhole. And it, I know it's far away, but can you see my toes? They made the prop too tall. <laughs> and, step, and it took two men to get me in and out of it. <laughs> yes, very interesting time. But anything that I wanted to do with it, with it uh, and I will add one more thing on that. Ah, here I am looking through the keyhole. <laughs> and do you remember why she was in the keyhole? I bet not. She was looking for Peter Pan's shadow, and she found it in the in the drawer. And that's what that was the whole scene. That whole scene took us three weeks of me coming back two days for the next three weeks to get all of that done. Then they take that film that they filmed. That you take one, and then you take one by, for protection. And then they take that film, they process it, they pick out the pictures that they want. They, and then Mark, in this case, Mark is the one who did all of the animation for her. He had in-betweeners. He would, he would do the scene because it was just so remarkable what he did with this little thing who didn't talk. That's why I call my, my book Tinkerbell Talks. <laughs> but uh, let's see what else I've got. Aha, OK. And then about four or five times, uh, the door would open on the sound stage. And in would walk Buddy Epson. Maybe some of you remember the long-legged dancer who played a detective in a TV show later on. Anyway, he's walking in, he's got a group of men, and Walt Disney's walking in with them. And uh, they, they were busy because I had no dialogue, I, anything. So they could leave the door open where the trucks come in and out and, and bring air in and so on. So we would do ours. They were working against a wall. And there's a picture of it in the book. Uh, well, two pictures of it, as a matter of fact. And what they were doing, they were figuring out how, to, uh, how tall the animated character should be with the human character for animatronics. It was the beginning of animatronics. I was there. If that wasn't exciting, I'll tell you. So uh, after they left, three or four, oh no, four or five times, uh, Walt Disney would come over to see Mark Davis and Jerry Geronimi, the director, and the cameraman. And I was invited into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had a cover up on. Oh my, I would walk around in a one-piece bathing suit with her. And so I was called Margaret, come over, and I'd go. <laughs> He's the head of the studio. I was taught from the time I was this high, you never see the head of a studio. And if you did, you curtsied. You know? Uh, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> It was, uh, it was also said the head of the studio was G-A-W-D, God. <laughs> and I'm still, I'm, I'm, no, I'm dumbstruck. Me, talk to me. Uh, but the fourth and fifth time, it, somebody had told him I had gone to school with his daughters. And he was so kind, he, he said, I understand you went to school with, with Sharon and Diane. And I told him, I said, yes, Monticello School for Girls. And he says, oh, I remember that place. I said, what? And can I digress from the story for a minute? I gotta tell you, I think you'll get a laugh out of this. Lady Burmester McBride ran Monticello School for Girls. Nobody really believed her. 
She was a New England red-headed woman who was dynamite. I would die for her. She was so wonderful. But she would do strange things. And he said, I remember what we called her on the phone. I said, you don't. He says, I do. Because here's what she would do. <clears throat> she would answer the phone. Uh, Monticello School for Girls, maybe for Mr. McBride speaking, commence the conversation, please. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the people would hang up on her. <laughs> she never did figure that. She died at 104 helping her sister run a lumber company. Oh, I mean, she was, she was, anyway, that was so sweet of him to even remember that. And he was just a dear. And I want to let you know, I know the family, I know him. Uh, all through the years of the people who worked with him, and he was all family. Everything was family. It was not dynasty at all. That's all he wanted was his family. So here I am, and I also did, I didn't bring it, but I did the, the red-headed mermaid. Do you remember her? We just wanted to drown her. <laughs> that was me. And so I went into voiceover acting, but in doing that, I got to work, and I'll make this very brief, I got to work with people like the Three Stooges. <laughs> I did 139 episodes with them. And what's this last one? Oh, I'll get to that in a minute. OK. <clears throat> so to, make, to bring it all together, how are we doing on time? You're at 36 minutes. 36, OK. Oh. I'm ahead of time, look at that. <laughs> You're in for it. <laughs> uh, but uh, Let's see, which one was I going to tell you? Oh, okay. I'm 94 years old. <laughs> well, it was wonderful, whatever it was, I'm sorry you missed it. <laughs> so so uh, anyway, uh, oh, I know, I know, I know, to make it. So I told you that I, I didn't know where I came from. I didn't know my family. I didn't. So here's again, God, God steps in. This is back a little bit earlier. Uh, oh, about, I guess, 20, 20 years earlier or something like that. I produced a 15-minute show, animated show, for the state of California called A Quake, Don't Let It Shake You. And it was quite a uh, prevention of what you could watch about in your house and so on and so forth. And as you know, the, the stations who bring people in on Sunday morning, the local people, to show, uh, to keep the station going actually and something interesting, they asked me to come in and talk about that. And they said, how did you know how to do this? Did you have a script? I said, I wrote the script. And they said, well, how did you, do? I said, well, I've been through two earthquakes. I mean, what more do you want? So uh, they showed it and everything was fine. And I stepped out into the hallway when I was finished. And this woman comes running out uh, down the hallway towards my friend, whom I'm saying goodbye to, and me. And she throws her arms around my friend. She said, I have found her. I have found my birth mother. I have found her. And off she went. And I said, oh, you know, Jennifer, what, what was that? And she said, well, there was a lady here two weeks ago is helping people find their birth mothers. I said, I was adopted. She said, let me give you her name. You know what's coming, right? Uh, and along with that, um, I actually found my whole family. Yes. And you know what? We come from County Kerry, Ireland. <laughs> Is that not amazing? Uh, I'm, I'm sort of in my talking about doing voiceovers now. I want to tell you the joke that I told when I was entertained. I started when I was about 19 years old on the stage. And this is a joke. You may laugh at it, but I love it. And, it's, and, I, and I'm bragging because I'm going to do an Irish accent. I speak 21 different dialects and I have about 48 different voices that I've used through the years. But this is one of my favorites, you know. So this is an Irish poem. And they're having a grand time over there. And they're talking about diversity. 
And when I say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be a, an Italian. No. And the other one says, oh, you'd love to be an Italian. All the girls would be after you. I don't think so. Oh, I know. Let's go ask Patty. He can tell you. So they walk over to where Patty is knocking them back pretty good and sitting there. And they said, Patty. He said, what is it? He says, Patty, what would you be if you weren't Irish? Patty says, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> and I told that joke and then when I was 54 years old, I could say, I'd be ashamed if I couldn't say I was Irish because I can now. And see how it all came together? All those things that you say, I wonder why that happened. I wonder why that happened. And you look back at my age and you say, now I know. I know why. I know. It's so exciting, I can't tell you. Okay, now, is everybody ready for the best story of the whole thing? Okay. Everybody stand up, shake out a little bit, and sit down. <laughs> On my 90th birthday, which is May 11th, I'm coming up to my 94th birthday, which by the way is 90 years in show business and I love everything about it. I just do. But this was my 90th birthday and I was in Glendale, California doing shows. When I go to shows, I go to celebrity shows and I talk to people about Tinkerbell and Disney and I sign autographs and I sign my books and so on and have a wonderful time. And I hope, and I think most of the people who, who chat with me feel the same way. So I was doing all of that, but still, I knew I was going to move out of California after 90 years. And I, I would say, I don't know where, I have no idea, I just know it. And I was going on about my business. Well, about three weeks later, I get an email from my website that said, how would you like to get back in touch with Robert E. Bokey, whom you dated 70 years ago? And you know what? Not only did I remember him that well, but I remembered his face. I think that is so odd. I kept one piece of jewelry all my life, and it was a, a, a wristband that his uh, a fraternity at USC was giving all the girls who went with him to their their, their uh, graduation dinner. And so I, I had that, and I had my mother's wedding ring. Those were the two things that I had saved. And I wrote back, and I said, I'd be delighted. But how in the world? Well, it turns out that Robert E. Bokey is a hero of World War II. He was in the infantry, and he was uh, in all over Europe, uh, almost into Russia, um, and then they, after that war was over, they took him over to the Philippines, and so he was ready uh, with that war, but which never happened because of the atomic bomb. So, on the 75th anniversary, I mean, you, you won't believe this, on the 75th anniversary of D-Day, that was Omaha Beach and all those places, they were having a huge celebration, and uh, the president of France, the president of everybody was there. It was, it was something. I have pictures of it. Um, they invited him to come and his friends, and he flew into Amsterdam. Keep that in mind. He flew into Amsterdam to pick up his ship that he was going from city to city with. And he said, let's get an Uber and drive down the street in Amsterdam and see what it's like. So he drove, they drove down and he said, stop. And the men stopped and across, just about like the end of that wall there, is a white store, of quite a large one, about the size of that, with the big sign in black, Tinkerbell's Toys. What was Tinkerbell doing in Amsterdam? I have no idea. <laughs> but anyway, he turned to his friends and he said, did I ever tell you I dated Tinkerbell? And they said, no, tell us. And the lady there was the group said, let me send an email to her, to uh, 
to her website. I found it on my, I, she had a wristwatch on or something like that. And that was the email that I got. And the next two days later, I, I, and of course I sent back, I would be delighted, I remember him so well. 70 years ago, is it? I sent it back and uh, so two days later I get a phone call, <clears throat> ladies, from France. If you don't think I wasn't impressed, I was. <laughs> and he, was, he has the most wonderful voice. So we started talking with each other and the different things. And I found out, A, he had never seen the movie Peter Pan. B, he had never seen the Andy Griffith show. C, he had never seen uh, the, um, the other shows that I was in. He knew nothing about show business. He had, after about 12 dates, he had to get a job. So he went to work for Exxon. And he climbed the ladder of Exxon. And he was an executive when he retired there. And he was a widower of eight years. And I was a widow of 20 years. And so we talked to each other. He was on the East Coast. I was on the West Coast. So I said, I have about 12 shows lined up that I've said that I will come. Is there any way for you to get to uh, Mount Airy, North Carolina? <coughs> Do any of you know about Mayberry Days? Yeah. We go there all, all, I've been there about 10 years. I, I show up. It's Third, oh, you've got to go, you've got to go. It's just wonderful. Tribute artists, everything. So I said, is there any way that you could drive up from South Carolina to North Carolina or get a train or a bus? I don't know. And he said, well, I have to have my 94th birthday party first. And I said, good for you. So three weeks later, he drove 10 hours up to, I beg your pardon, eight hours up to Mount Airy and he walked in where we were supposed to meet each other at the, uh, there was a golf tournament that starts Mayberry Days and there was a big dinner for everybody that was up. And he walked in and I, I swear to you, it was love at second sighting. <laughs> it really was. And he just bounced right in and started to help me with everything that I had to do, had, knowing nothing about it. And so he said later as we went to our own places, he said, let's have breakfast in the morning. And I said, sure, the Cracker Barrel. I mean, how romantic can that be? <laughs> so there we are at breakfast. His opening line to me, this gets better. His opening line to me is, I have to buy you a new house. How do you answer that? And I said, what? He says, where I live, nothing happens. People go out and play golf and they go back into their little rooms. Nothing happens. You need people, obviously. So I have to buy you a new house. But it has to be near a Costco's. <laughs> <laughs> well, to lighten the whole thing, because I didn't know where to go from there, I said to him, wait a minute. You mean you're a member of Costco's? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, you have a Costco card? He said, yes. I said, you'll let me use your Costco card? He said, yes. I said, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we'll have to put this together and we'll work it all out. And with Disney's blessing and uh, many others, uh, we were married uh, eight, six months later in the little brown church in the valley in Studio City, California, right near, right next to the studio. And uh, then the next day, they gave us a huge party at the Disney at the Smokehouse. And then the next day, we went to Walt Disney's Barn, which is a wonderful place of Griffith Park, which is, it's his real barn off of his real house. And all, it's all landscaped, it's just beautiful. And uh, 400 people came, including producers that I knew and directors that I knew, and they all met Robert. And he just hung in there. I tell you, they liked him. <laughs> he, has, he has the most gorgeous speaking voice. And then the next day, we flew off to Sarasota. And a week later, the you no, know, what's that called? Uh, epidemic. Anyway, that landed in <laughs> California. And they locked everything down. We, we escaped by one week. And, um, but Sarasota didn't have 
uh, anything open, but you, it was much easier, much easier to do things, but there was no one there for us to meet, except a few people who I worked for Ringling to raise money for them, helped them with their art department. It's, a, it's called College of Design. And many of my Disney artist friends do Tinkerbell for uh, commissions. It's a big thing. Tinkerbell is probably one of the most asked for characters that a Disney artist has done. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. After 72 years. <coughs> so anyway, um, so I'm over in Kissimmee, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right next to Orlando, and I call up Robert and said, you know, I'm, I'm coming home. And he says, well, I have a little something to tell you. And what? He says, you know, we were talking about moving to North Carolina where my friends are, and I play golf. I said, yes. He said, well, I think I sold our house, and we bought a house in North Carolina, so come on home. <laughs> we have to be there January 18th. Don't worry about it at all. Well, as, a, as an executive in, at Exxon, they moved him to 20 different uh, stations, and they got him a house at each one of them. So he thought nothing of moving in that short period of time. And that's how we ended up here in the lovely house that we have with his friends. And then I ended up in this lovely church with my friends. And, but can you believe it? If that isn't a God thing or a Disney thing, I, I, I would argue with anybody. What if they, he drove down another street? As simple as that. And we are so happy. It's been three, three years and three months. <coughs> And we like each other still very much. <laughs> and he's off playing golf. And then he's letting me uh, take off on a plane day after tomorrow. I fly off to Sarasota, and I'm doing another fundraiser for the university there, for the Ringling University. But isn't that, I mean, wasn't it worth getting up and stretching out and sitting down there? <laughs> I just want to end with this because Pastor started with this, which I thought was lovely. Uh, one of the things that I've been able to do is spread joy, spread absolute joy every place because I represent Tinkerbell and Tinkerbell represents joy and it makes it so easy for me to do. It's not just Margaret, it's Tinkerbell and I'm thrilled that I could do it. The second part is that I'm able to share my life's verse with it. I forgot to tell you, by the way, I have three children. I have a wonderful young man. He's 70 years old, and he's terrific. He loves the Lord. I have a daughter who is a minister. She has her doctors, I think, in ministry. And I have another daughter who is married to a pastor of a church, Amazing Grace, in Minnesota. And she is his assistant. And that's all because of Hollywood First Presbyterian looking for boys. So I'm able to tell people, I'm able to tell people, my life's verse is in Nehemiah. I don't know if you've read Nehemiah later, lately, but that is a kick in the head book. <laughs> I tell you, there are spies, there's everything. You don't have to go to any of this other stuff. But in, I think it's the 10th chapter, 8th verse, or vice versa. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And that's what he has given me through all of this. And you are my joy. God bless. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. On behalf of the Great Women's Group, a little token of our appreciation. I got a present beside Yes, you did. <laughs> so anyway, you, you have been such a blessing. And thank you for sharing your story with us. Well, it has been my pleasure. I, you know, Lord, you keep doing this for me. I'll, have, I'll stay with you. <laughs> and I did want to say about the book that my book looks formidable, but it's not. It's a Reader's Digest book. It has 160 pictures in it. It has 80 stories in it. The longest one is eight pages. The shortest one is one page. So you pick it up and read it any place that you want and just enjoy. Well, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Let us close in prayer quickly here. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your gift of Margaret. 
I know she has touched so many lives and she touched my life and the life of the ladies who came to hear her today. Also, Father, we pray that you are with us during this journey to the cross on Holy Week and that we feel your perfect uh, love and grace. Yes. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, break it up. <laughs> 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 oh, <that was> <laughs>